The Cube presents KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe 2022. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and its ecosystem partners. Welcome to Valencia, Spain and KubeCon, CloudNativeCon Europe 2022. I'm your host, Keith Townsend, along with Paul Gillen. And we're going to talk to some amazing folks. But first, Paul, uh, do you remember your college days? Uh, vaguely, <laughs> a lot of them are lost. I think a lot of minds are lost as well. Uh, well, not really, I, I, got, I got my degree as an adult, so they're not that far past. I can remember because I have the student debt to, to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> Along with us today is Kenneth Holste, a systems administrator at Kent University, and Marcel Hilt, Senior Manager Software uh, Engineering at Red Hat, office, uh, you're working in the office of the CTO? That's absolutely correct, yes. So first off, I'm going to uh, start off with you, Kenneth. Tell us a little bit about the research that the university does, like what, what, what's the end result? Oh wow, that's a good question. Um, so the, the research we do at university, and again, is very broad. We have bioinformaticians, physicists, um, people looking at financial data, all kinds of stuff. Um, and the end result can be very varied as well. Very often it's research papers or spin-offs from the university. Um, yeah, depending on the domain I would say, it, it depends a lot on. Uh, so that sounds like the perfect environment for cloud native, like the to, uh, infrastructure that's completely flexible, that researchers can come and have a standard way of interacting, each team just uses resources as they would. They're nirvana for cloud native. Yeah. But somehow, I'm going to guess HPC isn't quite there yet. Yeah, not really, no. So it, HPC is a bit, let's say, slow into adopting new technologies. Um, and we're definitely seeing some impact from cloud, especially things like containers and, and Kubernetes. So we're starting to he hear these things in an HPC community as well. But I haven't seen a lot of HPC clusters who are really fully cloud native. Um, not yet at least, maybe this, this is coming. And if I'm walking around here at KubeCon, I can definitely, I'm, I'm being convinced that it's coming. So whether we like it or not, it's, we're probably going to have to start uh, worrying about stuff like this. But we're still, um, let's say the most prominent technologies are sting, still things like MPI, which has been there for 20, 30 years. Um, the Fortran programming language is still the main language if you're looking at compute time being spent on supercomputers. Over half of the time spent is in Fortran code, essentially. Wow. So either the application itself, where the simulations are being done, is um, implemented in Fortran, or the libraries that you're talking to from Python, for, from example, for doing heavy duty computations, that backend library is implemented in Fortran. So if you take all of that into account, easily over half of the time is spent in Fortran code. So is this because the libraries don't migrate easily to uh, distributed uh, I, well, cloud like, environment? Well, it's multiple things. So first of all, Fortran is very well suited for implementing these type of things. Right. We haven't really seen a better alternative maybe. And also it would be a huge effort to re-implement that same uh, functionality in a newer language, so the, the use case has to be very convincing. It has to be a very good reason why you would move away from Fortran. And um, at least the HPC community hasn't seen that reason yet. So in theory, the th in th in right now we're talking about the theory and then what it takes to get to the future. In theory, I can take that Fortran code, put it in a compiler that runs in a container. Yeah, of course, yeah. Why isn't it that simple? I, I guess because traditionally HPC is very slow at adopting new stuff. So I'm, I'm not saying there, there isn't um, a reason that we should, should start looking at these things. Flexibility is a very important one. Um, for a lot of researchers, their compute needs are very peaky. So they're, they're doing research, they have an idea, they want to do run, run lots of simulations, get the results, but then they're silent for a long time writing the paper or thinking about how to, what they can learn from the results. So there's lots of peaks. And that's a very good fit for, for a cloud environment. Um, I guess that at the, at the scale of a university, you have enough diversity in, in users that all those peaks will never fall at the same time. So if you have your big own infrastructure, you can still fill it up quite easily and keep your users happy. Uh, but this bursty thing, yeah, I guess we're seeing that more and more. So, 
So Marcel, talk to us about Red Hat needing to service these types of, of end users that can be on both ends. I'd imagine that you have some people still writing the Fortran, you have some people that's asking for object-based storage. Mm -hmm. Where is Fortran, I'm sorry, not Fortran, but where is uh, Red Hat in, in, in providing the underlay and the capabilities for the HPC and AI community? Yeah, so I think if you look at the user base that we're looking at, it's, it's on this spectrum from development to production. So putting AI workloads into production, it's an interesting challenge, and it's, but it's easier to solve, and it has been solved to some extent, um, than the development cycle. So what we're looking at in, in, um, in Kenneth's domain is, it's more like the end user, the data scientist, developing code and doing his experiments. Putting them into production is, um, th that's where containers live and thrive. You can containerize your model, you can containerize your workload, you deploy it into your OpenShift Kubernetes cluster, done. You monitor it, done. So the, the software development and the SRE, the ops part, done. But how do I get the data scientist into this cloud native age where he's not developing on his laptop or in on a machine that where he SSHs into and then does some stuff there and then some sysadmin comes and needs to tweak it because it's running out of memory or whatnot. But how do we take him and make him well and provide him an environment that is good enough to work in in the browser in a with a IDE where the workload of doing the computation and the experimentation is, is repeatable, so that the environment is always the same. It's reliable, so it's always up and running. It doesn't consume resources, although it's up and running, um, where, it's, where the supply chain and the configuration of and the, well, the modules that are brought into the system are also reliable. So all these, all these problems that we solved in the Traditional um, software development, uh, software development world, now have to transition into the data science and HPC world, uh, where the problems are similar but yet different. So it's it's more or less also a huge educational problem and transitioning the tools over into that. Um, well, domain. is this mostly a technical issue or is this a, a cultural issue? I mean, are HPC workloads that different from more conventional? Uh, OLTP workloads that they would not adapt well to a distributed containerized environment? I think it's, it's both. So mm -hmm. on one hand it's the cultural issue because you have two different communities, everybody is reinventing the wheel, everybody is some sort of siloed, so they think, okay, what we've done for 30 years now, we, there's no need to change it, and they, so it's, that's what thrives, and here at KubeCon, where you have different communities coming together, okay, this is how you solve the problem, maybe this applies also to our problem, but it's also, also the, um, well the, the, the tooling, which is bound to a machine, which is bound to an HPC computer, which is architecturally different than a distributed uh, environment where you treat your containers as, as cattle, and as something that you can replace, right? And the uh, HPC community usually builds up huge machines and these are like the gray machines. So it's also a technical bit of moving it to this age. So the, the massively parallel nature of HPC workloads, you're saying Kubernetes has not yet been adapted to that? Uh, no, I think that, that the workload. parallelism works great. It's just a matter of um, moving that out from an HPC computer into the scale-out factor of a Kubernetes cloud mm -hmm. that elastically scales out, whereas the traditional HPC computer, I think, and Kenneth can correct me here, is more like a, I have this massive computer with uh, one million cores or whatnot, and now use it, and I can use my time slice there, book my time slice there, whereas the Kubernetes example uh, um, or concept is more like, I have 1,000 cores and I, declare something into it and I scale it up and down based on the needs. So, Kenneth, this is where you talked about the, the culture part of the changes that need to be happened. And quite frankly, the computer is a tool. It's a, it's a tool to get to the answer. And if the yep. tool is working, mm -hmm. if I have a thousand cores on a single 
HPC thing, and you're telling me, well, I can get to a system with 2,000 cores, and if you containerize your process and move it over, and maybe I'll get to the answer 50% faster, maybe I'm not, that someone has to make that decision. Mm -hmm. How important is it to get people involved in these types of communities from a researchers, because research is a very tight-knit community, mm -hmm. to have these conversations and, 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 and help that C move happen? I think it's very important to, that community should, let's say the cloud community and HPC research community, they should be talking a lot more. There should be way more cross-pollination than there is today. I'm, I'm actually, I'm happy that I've seen HPC mentioned at Boots and Talks quite often here at KubeCon. I, I wasn't really expecting that. And I'm not sure it's my first KubeCon, so I don't know, but I think that's kind of new. That's pretty recent. Um, if you're going to the HPC community, conferences there, Containers have been there for a couple of years now. Something like Kubernetes is still a bit new, but just this morning there was a keynote by um, um, a guy from CERN who, who was explaining that they're, ba they're basically slowly moving towards Kubernetes even for their HPC um, clusters as well. And he's seeing that as the future because all the flexibility it gives you and you can basically hide all that from the end user, from the researcher. They don't really have to know that they're running on top of Kubernetes. They shouldn't care. Like you said, to them it's just a tool, and they care about the tool works, they can get their answers, and that's what they want to do. How that's actually being done in the background, they don't really care. So talk to me about the AI side of the equation, because when I talk to people doing AI, they're, they're on the other end of the spectrum. What are some of the benefits they're seeing from containerization? I think it's the reproducibility of experiments. So. And d data scientists are, they, they are data scientists and they do research, so they care about their experiment and maybe they also care about putting the model into production, but I think from a, from a geeky perspective, they are more interested in finding the next model, finding the next solution. So they mm -hmm. do an experiment and they're done with it and then maybe it's going to production. So how do I repeat that experiment in a year from now so that I can build on top of it? And a container, I think, is the best solution to wrap something with its dependency, like freeze it, maybe even with the data, store it away, and then come to it back later and redo the experiment, or share the experiment with some of my fellow researchers so that they don't have to go through the process of setting up an equivalent environment on their machines, be it a laptop, be it a cloud environment. So you go to the internet, download something, doesn't work, container, works. Uh, you, you said something that really intrigues me, you know, in concept. I can have, uh, I can have a, let's say a one terabyte data set, have a experiment associated with that, take a snapshot of that somehow, I don't know how, take a snapshot of that, and then share it with the rest of the community and then continue my work, yeah. and then we can stop back and, and, and compare notes. Where are we at a maturity in a maturity scale? Like, what are some of the pitfalls or challenges customers should be looking out for? I think you actually said it right there. How do I snapshot a terabyte of data? It's that's that's, that's a tough. terabyte of data. That, it's a terabyte <laughs> of data. Challenge. And if you snapshot it, you have two terabytes of data. Or you just snapshot the like like in Git, you do a okay. This is currently where we're at. So that's where the technology is evolving. How do we do source control management for data? How do we license data? How do we um, make sure that the data is unbiased, et cetera? So that's going more into the AI side of things. But at dealing with data in a declarative way, in a containerized way, I think that's where currently a lot of innovation is happening. What do you mean by dealing with data in a declarative way? If I'm saying I run this experiment based on this data set, and I'm running this other experiment based on this other data set, and I as the researcher don't care where, um, the, where the data is stored. I care that the data is accessible. And so I might declare this is the process that I put on my data, like a data processing pipeline. This, these are the steps that it's going through, and eventually, it will have gone through this process and I can work with my data. Pretty much like applying the concept of pipelines to data. Like you have these data pipelines and they, now you have Kubeflow pipelines as, an, as one 
solution to it to apply the pipeline concept to, um, to well, managing your data. Given the stateless nature of containers, uh, is that an impediment to HPC adoption because of the very large data sets that are typically involved? I, I think it is. If you have terabytes of data, just you have to get it to the place where the computation will happen, right? And just uploading that into the cloud is already a challenge. If, if you have the data sitting there on that supercomputer, and maybe it was sitting there for two years, you probably don't care. And, and typically at a lot of universities, the researchers don't necessarily pay for the compute time they use. Like this is also, at least in Ghent, that's the case. It's centrally funded, uh, which means the researchers don't have to worry about the cost. They just get access to the supercomputer. If they need two terabytes of data, they get that space and they can park it on the system for years, no problem. If they need 200 terabytes of data, that's absolutely fine. But the university cares about the cost. The university <laughs> cares about the cost, but they want to enable the researchers to do the research that right. they want to do. And we always tell researchers, don't feel constrained about things like compute power, storage space. If you're doing smaller research because you're feeling constrained, you have to tell us. And we will just expand our storage system and buy a new cluster Wonderful. So you, to enable your research. It's a nice environment to be in. Uh, I think this might be a Javon's paradise problem. You, know, you, you give researchers this capability and you might, you know, you're going to see some amazing things, but now that people are snapshotting one, two, three, four, five different versions of, of a, one terabyte of data, it's a good problem to have and I hope to have you back on theCUBE talking about how Red Hat and Kent have solved those problems. Thank you so much for joining theCUBE. From Valencia, Spain, I'm Keith Townsend along with Paul Gillen and you're watching theCUBE the leader in high-tech coverage. <laughs>